And what I want to do is get to uh, some evidence that this is not a, a uh, topic that is academic. This is a topic that actually has direct clinical applications. The, the topic of highly processed food has begun to get a, a lot of attention, and we see it more and more when we look at comparing two diets that look similar but have very different results, as the previous speaker has mentioned. Uh, and with apologies to Gary Taubes, I'm presenting here a, uh, a one slide from a recently published study that included, it was, uh, the lead author was Kevin Hall at the NIH, uh, and they did a study where they compared two diets of some very close composition in terms of macronutrients, but one of them was made up mostly of highly processed foods, and the other was made up of highly unprocessed foods. And what this demonstrates is that over just a 14-day period of time, uh, the, uh, the, the caloric intake of the individuals on the highly processed food diet was much higher than on the uh, unprocessed diet. And the unprocessed diet subjects over 14 days lost about a kilogram of weight, where those on the highly processed diet uh, gained uh, close to a kilogram of weight. And this is just a 14-day interval. <clears throat> and uh, one has to be very careful with short-term studies like this because uh, people will adapt to changes in their diet slowly, not instantly. But what this implies is a diet that's highly processed it is also high, it, the reason it's highly processed is to make it highly palatable, so people will inherently eat more calories and potentially gain more weight. Uh, what's not uh, included in here is the fact that when you pro highly, when foods are highly processed, you lose nutrients, and uh, two of the most mundane nutrients uh, that I get to teach about as a nutritionist are potassium and magnesium. Uh, and both of them vary tremendously in terms of the content in similar looking foods, depending on processing. And a deficiency of one or both of those can have very significant impacts among, on many processes, including cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, and yet, you, you, know, you can't make a whole lot of money selling potassium or magnesium supplements, so there really is very little attention to this because there's very little industry support for that, that topic. Um, but if one wants to go back in, in relatively recent history, uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s, a very courageous person named Professor John Yudkin, Yudkin in uh, the UK um, was doing research on, on uh, uh, the most highly processed food, which is sugar, in the diet, and became convinced from very solid scientific evidence that uh, a high sugar intake was correlated with increased cardiovascular risk. Um, but that was the phase when the whole idea, the, the, in, starting with Ansel Keys' Seven Countries study, which was published in 1970, uh, that saturated fat was the villain that he not only got kind of shouted down, he was driven out of academia uh, by uh, the hostile forces of, of uh, uh, low fat, low saturated fat uh, over the concept of, of, of sugar. But, this graph on the right-hand side here is very interesting because it's basically uh, a carbohydrate tolerance test where they gave people a, a bolus of either um, uh, sucrose, which is uh, table sugar, glucose, pure glucose, or fructose. And what they measured here was a, a change in a biomarker of inflammation called C-reactive protein. And what this showed is that fructose and, and I'm sorry, glucose and sucrose were relatively benign, but fructose uh, had a very prompt and very significant um, uh, increase in C-reactive protein. And, and it's, this is very unusual to have a single dose of a nutrient that dramatically affects a biomarker of inflammation in such a short period of time. Uh, and then I want to move to probably one of the most controversial, if not the most controversial, nutrition study that, uh, published in the last 30 years, and this was uh, uh, public, uh, one of two publications, actually many publications, from the Lyon Diet Heart Study done in France, uh, in which uh, 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 Dr. Delogerel and colleagues uh, selected almost 600 patients, who, uh, French people who already had one heart attack, so they were at high risk of a second heart attack, and they randomized them to two diets. One of them was a so-called prudent diet uh, uh, recommended at the time by the American Heart Association for people to prevent uh, heart attacks, and the other was a Mediterranean diet that was rich in fruit, vegetables, fish, and olive oil. And by the way, 
<clears throat> there is no strict definition of a Mediterranean diet. This is one of the things where you ask four experts, you get five opinions as to what it, what's composed of. Uh, but this, this one, they, they carefully documented what they were recommending to people. And the primary fat that they advocated was olive oil. But I will, because people will stand up in the audience and say, but they gave them margarine made with canola oil. But there was a, a, a small amount of, of solid, you know, solidified uh, canola oil as margarine, uh, and they did not use butter, uh, which we can criticize them for that. But the fascinating results of this study is that within, and they planned to do a five-year study, so uh, the plan was to do this across a five-year study, but they tracked the people, and what they noticed from within the first year, there was a trend in reduction in coronary risk in the patients eating the Mediterranean diet as opposed to the prudent diet. And by the time they got out past two years, it was obviously and significantly different, and so they stopped the study. But they still tracked people, even though they'd, they told them, go back to whatever you want to eat. Uh, and there was a very uh, dramatic difference in coronary risk. And you say, wow, that's great. But the reason why this is so controversial is they could not find no difference in total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL triglycerides. All of the usual suspects in terms of cardiovascular risk did not appear to differ significantly between the two groups. The only thing that, uh, that differed significantly was that the group eating the Mediterranean diet had a lower white blood cell count. Now, white blood cells are in our bloodstream ostensibly to protect us from infection, to help us deal with acute wounds and injury. So it goes up when we're injured and comes down when the injury or the challenge goes away. But here there's a difference between the two diets and white blood cell count. And this is uh, um, a, a relatively early indicator of the importance of inflammation as an underlying cause of, of heart disease. That wasn't a novel observation, however, because this was published uh, first in, uh, this paper was published in, um, uh, I believe, 1994, and, and this was the preliminary results, and then they had a very exhaustive review of all the other variables in 1999. 